So I'm not an expert in things to do with open, but um, it's a pleasure to be here and give you my perspective. Um, my perspective may be wrong, but it'll all be corrected after me. I, uh, Neva, where, where are you? I saw you somewhere. Anyway, um, so uh, let me just say a couple of things. I have um, three perspectives on the subject of openness, and uh, one of them has to do with my being the president, uh, not of the IEEE, of the IEEE Computer Society, which is one of the um, one of the subsets, one of the societies of the IEEE. There are 38 societies, and the most important one, of course, is the one I'm president of, the Computer Society. It's the largest. We're about 25 percent of the whole IEEE membership, 400,000 members around the world, 100,000 in, uh, in the Computer Society, and a very, very active uh, uh, set of academics and members here in Israel. And now every time I come to Tel Aviv, sometimes Herzliya, I try to meet with uh, the IEEE people here so that uh, the Israeli scientists, computer scientists, and academicians get better and better recognition which you know, of course, uh, though you deserve it, they deserve it. It's, they don't get the kind of recognition that they should get, I think, in the world. Anyway, I have a perspective that I'll talk a little bit about on the subject of openness to do with that position uh, in the IEEE. Um, I have a perspective that has to do with Merlot, and I'll, I'll talk more a little bit about Merlot and what that perspective is. And then a little bit, I am a professor, professor of information systems at California State University says here all these things. Um, then I have an academic perspective, which I can summarize as follows as a professor. Uh, what's mine is mine, and, what, and what's yours is mine also. <laughs> so that's the academic perspective on openness. <clears throat> Pardon? So uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, open education resources. I'm going to give you a perspective, as I say, it's more like a little bit of a tutorial. First of all, open education resources, as you can see, are materials that are really online. Um, they're digitized, <coughs> and they're open and freely available free for education, educators, students, and anybody who comes and tries to wants to learn something on, on the uh, internet. And the materials are available for people to use should be, and reuse. So if I find something or you find something on, on the internet and you want to use it in your class, if it's a, truly an open education resource, if you're an instructor, then you should be able to do that. So the second bullet, they should be there for free for you to use, for people to use. Um, so in the, in the final bullet, it, it's sort of a little bit of redundancy, but they Open education resources reside in the public domain and they should be released under some kind of intellectual property license. So, and I'll, and I'll explain a little more in a minute, so that when you find this thing, whatever it is on the internet, uh, you should know what you really are allowed to do with it and what you're not allowed to do with it. What, why, why do, so this is, what do we mean here by open? It's free, second bullet. This doesn't mean you can do whatever you want with it, because I said it, has, it should have some kind of license that conveys information about how uh, it's intended to be used. It should be reusable, recyclable, and remember in the academic world, especially if you're doing research and now in instruction, we build on the work of others. So the, the notion of openness is to take something somebody else has done and be able to extend it and, and do your own thing with it that uh, could be different and better than, mm -hmm. oh, there you are, um, than, than was done originally. <clears throat> so with openness, it's like building on the shoulders of others. It's like putting educational innovations into practice easier. And we know openness is the academic way. Before the internet, um, and with traditional print materials, we, as, as faculty, always, always felt that if we had to do, wanted to do a handout to our 30, 40 students or whatever it was, we'd make copies, even though, uh, even though the material 
may be copyrighted uh, by somebody else, we have this fair use notion, which essentially allows, we think, we believe, that allows us to make copies for, for instructional uses. But you can, we'll hear more about that later. Openness and sharing. Now, everybody uses this word open. Um, and I think that there's, there needs to be clarity about what we're talking about when we talk about open. There are, at least in my experience, three different kinds of open materials. We have open source, we have OER, open education resources, and we have open access. These are not the same. So just because you're using the word open, it doesn't necessarily, and, and the characteristics of each one of these don't apply across the board to all of them. Open source, what does it mean? It's to do with software, open source software. Uh, so we don't talk about open source, it, this is what we mean. So here's some examples of uh, open source software. Linux, the operating system Linux, Moodle, the learning management system Moodle. Um, there's, there's something called freeware, um, which may or may not be open source. And, and so it's software, open source software. Now, open education resources have, have a different kind of meaning. First of all, the term was uh, adopted, as you can see here at this uh, UNESCO forum, um, uh, 11 years ago, funded by the uh, Hewlett Foundation. On the left, the characteristics of OER materials, you can see here, I said this before, in the public domain, with uh, an I, some kind of licensing for the intellectual property, Freely accessible, that means it's on the web, <coughs> freely reusable, and accessible on the web. Here are some examples. Um, learning objects are, can be examples of open, uh, of open education resources. And I'll, I'll talk about Merlot as a source for learning objects in a minute. Open courseware, OCW, and we talked a little bit about that before. Um, is another example. Open textbooks, remember all of this stuff is, has to be on the web, so open textbooks are textbooks that meet the criteria that you see on the left side of the screen here. Open access journals can be, but are not necessarily uh, an example, uh, examples of open education resources, and I'll talk a little bit about open access uh, in, uh, shortly. And again, even open source uh, uh, software can be open educational, an example of open educational resources, probably, and mostly probably is. There are many, 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 many sites for you to search uh, to do with open resources. And I mean, there's no way I'm going to talk about all of these, mostly because I don't know what they all are, I know what some of them are. Um, this thing here, connections on the top left, is somewhat similar to um, at Merlot, which I will tell you about. So Merlot is the one that I'll use as an example for open education resources. So Merlot, um, I know that a lot of you know what Merlot is. I, I, I don't know, I, I believe that some of you don't know what Merlot is. I'm not going to do a, a, a tour of Merlot. But Merlot is an acronym. It stands for Multimedia Educational Resource for Learning and Online Teaching. Um, many people think that Merlot is a library of a repository, digital repository, those who know at all what it is, um, but it's not. Really. Merlot is a community where people can come together, faculty, staff, and students from around the world to share their learning materials and their experience. The nucleus of Merlot is the digital repository. Merlot um, is a uh, about 14 years old, and it was created in California as a project of the California State University system. Uh, within a year, other universities in the United States said, this is a great thing. This is a digital library of learning materials. And they wanted also to have access to this digital library, to participate in its development, and so forth. So Merlot became, very quickly, a consortium. <coughs> And it became a consortium of uh, universities uh, across the United States into Canada, and and it's developed very significantly to the to the point now where there are more than 
100,000 registered users of Merlot. It's free. And, and there are there is in Merlot uh, 30,000 different learning materials. And by the way, I use the term learning materials as opposed to learning objects, which in a more academic sense I suppose would be correct. But I don't use the term learning objects because there are many people in many camps that say, this is what a learning object is. No, this is what a learning object is. No, this is what... So we don't get involved with that kind of debate because we're more concerned rather than debating uh, is, this, is this right or is that right? So I'll use the umbrella term learning materials. But you should know that when you hear the term learning objects, um, and it, sometimes it slips because it depends on if I'm writing about this or not. Uh, we're talking here essentially about learning objects, and, 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 uh, but we'll call them learning materials. So um, we have about uh, 30,000 uh, mater uh, materials in Merlot. And let me say that we don't actually host the materials. And this is important because it goes to the theme here of openness. What in fact we do uh, host are metadata uh, that describe, like adjectives, if you like, that describe these materials that are hosted somewhere on the internet, somewhere um, in the cloud. <clears throat> Why is this to do with openness? Because we, if somebody comes to Merlot and does a search, and we have a wonderful search engine, which is called Lucene, which happens to be open source, it's an open source um, uh, search engine that we that we deploy, deployed inside of Merlot. If somebody finds a material inside of Merlot, we get the question: Can we use it for this? Can we use it for that? And we say, and I'll show you shortly. We say, you know, we don't own that thing. It's I, I can't even claim that it's truly whatever it is. I can't claim that it's an open educational resource. What I can claim is that the descriptors, the metadata of, of that uh, learning material, that, the metadata, are, that's an open education resource. But if you want to know what the license that allows you to use the material is, you have to go to the owner of the material and wherever it resides. And then the debate is between you and the owner, leave me alone. Isn't this part of the metadata? What? The license. So the question is, the, it's a complicated question. The material itself has a license. Not my problem. But you record it. One of the metadata items that we have in Merlot is the license of the material. I would like to tell you that for all the 30,000 materials, I would like to tell you, but, I, but it isn't, wouldn't be true, that every one of those things has um, the license definition, but it isn't so. More and more, we're getting these things. Where do the materials come from? Anybody who comes, let's say you're an instructor, and um, you build something, and I'll talk about that in a minute, or you're an instructor and you discover something on the internet, and you think, this is great, I'm going to use it. And not only am I going to use it, I'm going to tell the whole world about it, and I'm going to put it in the Merlot collection. So when you put it in the Merlot collection, you have to describe this thing. And we have different uh, metadata to allow you to direct describe this thing. And one of, for example, what discipline is it in it, uh, what uh, grade level is it for, things like that. One of the metadata items is, does it have a license, is it copyrighted? Does it have a Creative Commons license? And if so, what's the Creative Commons license? Well, the sad fact is, we're 14 years old. 14 years ago, people didn't pay much attention to that stuff. More and more in education, we are paying attention to that stuff. And so, um, more, so often in Merlot, it's a, I don't know. That's what they put in. I don't know if it has a Creative Commons license. So if you find something in, in Merlot, and it says, I don't know, and you want to use it, it's your responsibility, the instructor's responsibility, to go to the item and see on the website, if possible, what the what the uh, uh, what the license is for its use or reuse. So you know, we we just step back and let the let the debate be between the instructor and the 
creator and the owner of the material. So, um, so we're a community, and I said we're a consortium. Barbara? I'd say about 20% of the materials in Merlot has a creative common source. 20%. And I can tell you that uh, five years ago, we didn't even know because we didn't have the metadata item. Now we have it. Let me tell you something else. I'll, I'll just leap ahead. One of the, one of the, shh. <laughs> I, I forgot to tell my students in this class to turn off your cell phones. <laughs> anyway, um, one of the things that we have in Merlot is a tool for people to create learning materials. It's a new thing. We inherited it and integrated it from the Carnegie Foundation. It's called, it's called the, uh, was called the Carnegie Keep Toolkit. Uh, we have changed it, integrated it, and it's now called the Merlot Content Builder. And people can create learning materials with this in Merlot and then contribute them into our collection. So I can build a website, I can put it up on my server, I can tell people in the whole world it's there, but, but, we do not allow people who create learning materials with the content builder to put that stuff in Merlot, in the collection, without a Creative Commons license. You cannot put, so we're very much committed to uh, Creative Commons in Merlot. Anyway, let me keep going and say that um, we, we have about 100,000 members, 30,000 materials, about... 15% of them are peer-reviewed. I won't go into all of that. Um, and I said we're a community, and that's how we came by, came to, to uh, here to be in Israel four years ago, because we are a consortium, and uh, as a member of the consortium is uh, is uh, Maytel, and the Mayor uh, Portal is an activity that stemmed from the membership with us as part of the consortium. So I, I just to put a plug in there for you. So this is, I've I, here's some of the statistics, the analytics about Merlot. 98,000 uh, members, and we're growing at about 1,200 a month. Uh, we probably should have some kind of big prize for the 100,000th for the member, but of course we won't because mm -hmm. we're we have budget issues. <laughs> We'd like to fly them to Hawaii or something, but we can't do that. Anyway, you see how many materials we have. About 10% are peer-reviewed, et cetera, et cetera. And how many visits per month? This is the website. I'm not going to go and show it to you. But, oops. Um, this, it's www.reload.org. Uh, the last couple of days, Barbara has been doing workshops on Reload. Some of you, um, some of you, and the content builder, and some of you have been in those workshops. And I even recognize some faces from before. So this is the Merlot website. I don't have the Mayor website. And it is, Merlot itself is an open resource, or as you like, open, it's not a, it's an open resource tool to find all of this stuff. OER, Open Education Resources, that's the learning materials, some of them. Open Access Articles, remember that's different than OER, or can be and open texts and open courses, which may or may not be open education resources. So in Merlot, you can find all of these things. And in our advanced search, um, we have a metadata item called material type. Material type. And you can search for these different things. So you can see we have, you can search for open courses, you can search for open journals and open textbooks. <coughs> oh, oh, this would be open access, um, should more properly be called that. So if you do a search in Merlot for open access articles, which I did here, this was as of about a week or so ago, there are 525 open access articles, separate articles, out of journals. If you, now I want to talk about this to show you how you um, separately, how we deal in California, in, at least in the California State University system, uh, with uh, open textbooks and open courses. 
There is an initiative in the California State uh, University system called Affordable Learning Solutions. And the philosophy behind Affordable Learning Solutions is to try to provide um, as much and as often as possible the lowest cost learning materials for students. Because everyone knows, especially in the STEM area, textbooks are really, really expensive. And in, in, in California, uh, you, you must have read, we lead in everything. And I think we lead, California leads in many, many um, social areas. And one of the social areas I'm afraid we're leading in is, is in the defunding of education. So we have some serious funding issues in, the, in education in California. And we have a higher unemployment rate, one of the highest unemployment rates in the country. And our students, and ex uh, we are raising, we raise the tuition a lot, all the time, sometimes twice a year. And education is be uh, becoming unaffordable to an awful lot of higher education to a lot of students. So it's important for us in California, in the California state system, to come up with something called affordable learning solutions. If you go to the Merlot website, there's a tab across the top, and it's called Communities. If you clicked on the tab, you come to a new page, and I, I, I'm not doing all of that. And one of the communities that we have in there is this one here. It's called Affordable Learning Solutions. And, and it's all about openness and, and how to bring down the, the cost and the price of education. And in this case, it's to do with learning materials. And so you can see here, free course materials, so that would be the open courseware. Free textbooks, that would be open textbooks, etc., etc. If I do a search on online course materials in Merlot, courses, um, we'll find that there are 2,200 courses, whole complete courses in Merlot. That's a learning material. A whole course is a learning material, at least, or <coughs> it's even a learning object um, if you want to get into the definition, definitions. Now, these courses in Merlot have been harvested. Some of them have been, have been put in by individuals. Some have been developed by individuals. And we have harvested, um, at this point, about, about 1,100 courses from uh, OCW? Uh, no, about uh, 1,600. 1,600. And there are 1,000 more that are in process waiting for me <laughs> to review. So let's see, this is. Uh, September. I was supposed to have this done by March last year, this past March. So anyway, there will be, by the end of the year, uh, 3,000 complete courses. What's their quality? I can't say. But they're categorized using the Merlot Learning Materials metadata. And at the top level, that's certainly by discipline, by a level, educational level, etc. So the, these are findable uh, two ways. One, through this uh, uh, portal and one community and one through the advanced search. So of course they would be available more. Yes, right. Thank you. Uh, the Mayor uh, portal um, has a great deal of functionality uh, that's it's actually a subset of functionality that's available in Merlot. So uh, one of the functions that's available through the Mayor website is that search that I showed you right at the beginning with that drop down list. That search, that kind of search, is direct, is, except that it's in Hebrew, is, is the same as the search, our advanced search, and the Merlot website. So these courses are searchable through, in Hebrew, through the Merlot, through the Mayor website also. Yeah, good. Um, also, there, one of the tabs here is open textbooks. And if you do a search on open textbooks, that means free, um, essentially open access. There are more than 2,000 textbooks uh, findable that you've discoverable in Merlot that are part of the collection of 30,000. So, a little bit about learning object rights. As I said before, who owns this stuff if you find it? If you develop it, what are your rights? Like, can you keep it or not keep it? Can you charge for it, not charge for it? Can you make it open education or not? These are lots of questions. What rights does an instructor have to use, copy, or change 
some material that he, he or she discovers on the website. And I developed material, let's say, in the United States, and what are my rights here in Israel? And how do you know any of this stuff? Well, this is where we come, of course, to Creative Commons. And I believe at this point, in this room anyway, everybody knows what Creative Commons is. And Creative Commons has a very nice little, if you're creating materials, Creative Commons has a very nice little way for you, in English, uh, to declare to declare what kind of rights you as a developer want to allow other people, to show to other people that indicate uh, what you would let them do with the material that you have created. And there are, there's a combination of six different kinds of licenses. I won't describe them all, but for uh, essentially what, what this, this says is that if you discover one of these little uh, icons on a website, on, on a website or somewhere on the internet, then these little icons convey to you what's allowed by the person who created the thing in the first place. And it, and pretty much in common, they all have. If you discover something, you need to and you reuse it. You need to say what the license, where you found this thing. It's an attribution. It's like a reference if you're in the paper, a citation. Um, you have to say, if you own the thing, if it's yours, whether you're going to allow it to be reused for commercial or non-commercial purposes. So if I make something, and, 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 and I'm making it available to everybody, and uh, Ellie discovers it, and he says, I'm going to take this thing, and make a few changes, or not, and I'm going to sell it, well, my license, that I've put on a Creative Commons license will t should tell him whether I want him to be able to do that or not. Mostly, you know, the stuff you find in education is non-commercial. Attribution, derivative, not derivative. If I'm making something available on the internet, uh, do I want people to be able to change it or not change it if they're going to use it? That's what derivative, not derivative means. And share alike means if I've created something, Whatever I've allowed you to do, if I want you, you if, if I've declared this share-alike thing, it means you have to carry the license that I created on this in the first place on to whatever you do with, with the material. So Merlot, let's you talk about Merlot. Uh, first of all, Merlot, as I said before, we encourage the use and reuse. How much time do I have the material? 20 minutes? So I came to India, I had to do a speech in India, I just have to tell you this, and uh, they told me, you have 45 minutes, okay, it's good, I, you know, it's a lecture, so I come to India, and I, I'm, I'm sitting here, and I whispers in my ear, you have 20 minutes, 20 minutes, I've got 45 minutes worth of slides, okay, 20 minutes, we, we learn how to do that, and I stand up here, 20 minutes, at the 10th minute, he puts up a sign, you have two minutes. <laughs> It's a long way to go to speak for eight minutes. Anyway, um, so Merlot wants to protect members. We don't just, we're very concerned about the members of our community. We want to protect your intellectual property. And as the third bullet says, um, we endorse and recommend uh, Creative Commons licenses. And the fourth bullet is, again, I'll say, that when somebody uses a Merlot tool to build something on the internet, and, we, and they want to make it public, we don't let them make it public unless they declare a Creative Commons license. So they can't do it. So, and the bottom uh, left-hand corner here is the Creative Commons license that I've declared in my presentation, which says, you can do what you want with it, but I don't want you to make any money from it. That's so, and I guess you'll make it. So let me tell you um, uh, about let me tell you about Merlot and how, in another way, we use um, Creative Commons. Merlot has many different kinds of web pages. It's a really quite an extensive website. And people come and they call us and they want to know, can we use this page in our book? Can we use this page in our journal? Can I do a print screen? Can I do with this? Can I do with that? So I went through all the different kinds of pages in Merlot, and, and here is the, this whole thing is a description of 
Who owns what? Everything in Merlot is not owned by Merlot. We didn't create everything that's there. But essentially in Merlot, now I'm not talking about the materials, I'm talking about the web pages that make up the website. We essentially say, make as many, do what you want with it, you can copy it, make derivatives, not for commercial purposes, except, one exception, in Merlot, when somebody finds a material, we allow them, of course, we want, you can rate it, you can make comments, and so forth. If you come to a page in Merlot and you find comments by somebody, then we say you cannot make a derivative out of the comments. We also have threaded discussions. You cannot make a derivative out of, out of anything you find in the discussions. Why not? If I make a comment, this is a really great material, I don't want somebody coming and t taking it, making a derivative, and saying, Sorrel Reisman said, this is not a great material. So we say no derivatives on uh, member comments or, or discredited discussions. Let's talk uh, quickly about open access. Now, um, I know you're going to talk a lot more about open access. I'm going to tell you about open access putting on a different hat. My IEEE uh, hat, I was the vice president of publications uh, for the IEEE Computer Society three years ago and four years ago, and was on the publications board longer than my children have been around, almost. And there was no such concept of, as open access, but it's becoming, in the IEEE world, and the publishing world, very, very important. Um, and it essentially concerns journal articles, usually peer-reviewed journal articles. And the idea of open access is that, we, the second bullet here, is that readers can retrieve articles without financial access. In other words, every, it should be free. You should be able to go and find a peer-reviewed article, copy it, and reuse it. And here are the arguments why people want to do this. Um, it's often because people don't want to pay for things. That's really the bottom line. It's because when people go to the web, they expect everything to be for free. But the, 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 the main argument where this originated, it originated, I believe, in the UK, where, and, and, and it's caught on here in the health industry, medical industry uh, mostly, originally, uh, it's because the funding for research in these industries often has been paid for by the government, which is really taxpayer money. So the argument is, we've already paid for the research, uh, which means we've already paid for the publication, taxpayers. There shouldn't be yet another charge uh, for the paper itself that describes the research that, uh, that we've already paid for. So that's what this says. Um, when we get down here to the third bullet, Libraries, everybody, but libraries, and probably a lot of librarians here, are, are, there are probably a lot of librarians here, there are shrinking budgets. Uh, it costs, the uh, journal subscriptions are very expensive, digital library subscriptions are very expensive. Uh, and there's perception that if you find it on the, on the internet, it really should be free. So um, this open access movement is a, an attempt to a, address people's desire to, to have access in a free way, just almost like what we are, to these uh, peer-reviewed publications without having to pay a subscription fee to the journal. This is a problem from the publishing stand, a publishing standpoint, because if uh, uh, if I'm a publisher and I'm supporting a journal, I'm, that means that people think that it's you know if, if you're putting online. You're eliminating the cost of printing. You're eliminating the cost of distribution. That's all true. You're reducing it. But what you're not eliminating is the cost to, for the support organization to do the peer review. The whole editorial board, um, whatever, the, the, and the staff to support it, the editorial process, the process of submission. Everybody, anybody who's ever published a paper knows that, the, that there's a, a, a online, whether it's for print or not, there's a system that has to be maintained, an information system, to manage the whole peer, peer review process. It's not cheap. And so there is a cost for uh, supporting and making available, even internet available articles. So some of the things that, uh, that publishers are doing is they're saying, okay, you know, uh, we're going to publish the paper 
in our journal, people will have to pay a subscription, uh, continue to pay the subscription, um, and we will make it available in an open access model a year from now. Or they tell, they tell the author, you can post your paper on your server if you want, but we are going to continue to publish it on the internet in an open access, in a non-open access fashion. So the, the publishers are, really don't know what to do. So there's a lot of um, controversy about what model is the right model. Well, the last bullet there is an important one. Open access publishing has yet to, uh, to demonstrate financial sustainability. We have an open access journal. I'll tell you one other thing the publishers are doing that we're going to start to do. We have an open access journal. It's called JOLT, Journal of Online Learning and Teaching. It's a Merlot publication. You can find it um, off the website. Merlot is free. Anybody can come to Merlot and, and search for materials, and find materials, etc. Jolt also um, is free. It's truly open access. The problem we have with Jolt is it's costing us more and more and more money uh, to uh, maintain that kind of infrastructure that I just described that publishers have. So it's costing us money. And it's as a publisher of this thing. And so what we are going to be doing uh, in the very near future is we're going to be uh, initiating a fee that authors have to pay to, if they want their paper, uh, published in Joel. Now the, the kinds of, and then this is becoming more and more typical. <laughs> this is becoming more and more typical. Journal publishers more and more for their papers, for if authors want their paper to be open access, somebody's got to pay. And the fees range from between 500 and a few thousand dollars, depending on uh, what the publication is. And, and there's a new phenomenon that's coming, and that is when people uh, submit grant proposals, they have in the grant proposal now line items that say, uh, I mean, I'm going to need three thousand, five thousand, ten thousand dollars, in addition to my research uh, cost of my research to, pay, to publish the papers. So open access is not free, and there are some challenges. I kind of have. Uh, I, he's telling me that my eight minutes is up, and I will go. There are many challenges, and thank you. Oh, my, I, I have uh, minus 10 seconds for questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very what, much. What, oh, what, what, what is an open, uh, open text? What do you mean by open text? Well, an open text can be an open education resource or it can be an open access to uh, article. Okay, but there is another word about books and so on. If so. you go to Brillau and you do a search for open text, you'll find there whether or not it's an open access journal. Now, an open text, typically, we mean it to mean that, the, that it's truly open education resource. It's free. It's a digitized textbook. Everything, remember, everything has to be open, it has to be on the internet. So that implies every digital. Yes? Uh, one comment about your last point. Um, the publication fee is a one-time fee. Yes, yes, one-time fee. While the uh, um, subscription to the magazines are an annual fee, which are, of course, much larger. And I think by time they will be able to uh, finance the whole model. I, ho I hope you're right, because in the IEEE Computer Society, we have 25 publications, real publications, journals and magazines, transactions, and... Um, we're really fighting the open access movement because we can't see, uh, for the foreseeable future, a financial model that's going to work for us. It's probably a $15 million operation for us. Uh, we don't, can't see recovering $15 million in any way, shape, or form if everything goes open access. I hope you're right. I'm a professor also. Another question. Yes. Well, she had the question. Yes. Um, I can't quite explain to me. It's possible to um, kind of uh, sharpen the 
edge the advantages that Merlot has over uh, Wikipedia and Wikimedia. And I don't exactly understand why you, you don't harvest automatically uh, materials. Is it because you have to process it differently? Well, th that's, not, that's not to do with what the theme is here, but I will tell you, we don't harvest. We, we really um, respect the rights of other collections. If, uh, if somebody comes to us and says, would you harvest us, we'll have an agreement with them that they legally give us their permission. Or if we find a collection that we think we should harvest, that would be useful to our members, we will go to them and seek permission. But we, we can't just go and copy stuff. So we don't harvest unless we have a, some kind of legal agreement. Barbara? Pardon? We searched libraries, but we don't harvest. Do we keep something on the Merlot uh, uh, server? Do, do, do you keep some materials on yeah. the Merlot server? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Right. Um, the 30,000 materials, we host metadata, not the materials. Only the metadata. But when you create something with this content builder thing that we have, Okay. We actually do host those materials. Yes. And uh, how do we deal with the fourth link? And so, the what? How do we deal with the fourth link? Fourth link. The fourth link to the materials on the web. Fourth. 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 Oh, okay. fourth. Not oh broken, link. broken links. Uh, broken, broken. Okay. Barbara over there is the development manager. And she's also, I'd like to hope she's only the acting webmaster. Every month we run a link checker. I've got all our links there. And, um, and, we, and, and, and when we get, I know, and when we get broken links, we actually investigate right down to the server level. And we get, we, we'll communicate with the author, we'll communicate with the contributor. And if we can't determine where the thing is now, we delete it. The other thing we do is if somebody finds a broken link, uh, there's an, uh, a little, there's a link that sends an email to Barbara, we have a broken link. So we're very careful about that. There are different implications to harvesting objects and harvesting just the metadata. Yes, that's right. I know. So we don't of course you don't harvest objects, but, but generating uh, metadata on open uh, resources on the web is something else. Our metadata is truly open. I can't speak for others. On our website, I have declared that our metadata is open under the under these same uh, under that Creative Commons license. And, and that's right. I'm saying you can go out and harvest uh, open no. metadata for. Uh, we we will only do it. There's the OAI protocol, for example. If the license says, if the license says you can, and we have the resources to do it, we'll do it. But if there's no license, or when we don't, you know, we're an organization. Yeah, yeah. I have uh, two comments and one question. So the two comments are one related to Creative Commons. You said that it's, uh, you mentioned that. Uh, Creative Commons licenses will tell you in English, and I just want to say to this I, I audience mean, I, 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 that um, Creative Commons licenses can also talk to you in Hebrew, and we have all the licenses translated to Hebrew, so if you write your materials in Hebrew, you can use it uh, in Israel and for Hebrew readers as well. The second comment has to do uh, with the publishing model that you uh, describe, and I think that uh, in some areas of science, uh, publishing is really sponsored by academic institutions, including the review process and including the management. So. Uh, you mentioned before that we already paid for the, for the research, and in some cases, we already paid for the publishing as well. And so I think, uh, and here is where my question comes, uh, when you decide or consider shifting into a model where you're going to charge the scholars or the scientists for the publication, I think um, it's, uh, there are lots of risks that are involved related to the fact that only the researchers, 
that will be able to fund the publication will be able to be published. So this may have some distorting effect on science because once you have to convince the foundation to give you the grant money and then uh, only those, you know, those uh, studies that were already funded will be able to be published and when we think of open science, I think the vision is to create a more, a more open environment that would actually provide some access to knowledge. So I would um, consider, you know, some of these uh, uh, implications on, on the scientific paradigm related to the decisions that you may take in terms of the policy. Right, and the, the very, uh, two things. Uh, First of all, I didn't go into this slide. This is off the Open Access uh, Creative Commons site. You can see what I highlighted there. Uh, when you create a license, you, you, you also one of the things you also have to should say is what country that this is going to be. And I, I selected here Israel, uh, but I didn't talk about it. I didn't have time. Um, and, and the last slide had to do with challenges. There's no question that the mo publishing model is changing dramatically. And the table that you told me earlier that uh, you, you sit around and debate these things, the last slide had to do with challenges. We don't even know what the challenges are going to be yet, but um, I, I, it's, it's a grim thing what you said. Um, and we see it already. And there's a lot of controversy about corporations that are affecting the kinds of publications that we're seeing, including the results in the publications. So lots of things are changing. And I, I mean, I, I don't know what the answers are. Depends what hat I put on. <laughs> I'm a professor. What's mine is mine. What's yours is mine. When I'm a publisher, what's mine? What's yours is mine. And what's mine is mine. And I'm going to charge you for it. <laughs> so, from, from a reviewer's standpoint, it's maybe even better to charge them <laughs> because you, you see, if, you know, some countries, you know, they just submit papers. I mean, believe me, I can talk. I can do a whole other bunch of hours on that one. And there's also speaking of that. Oh, let's not speak. I'll turn over the floor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.